the Sermon on the Mount. That's going to be our topic for the next few weeks. I mean, let's make that several weeks. Because it takes up Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. I think I can say without much objection that the Sermon on the Mount represents the most consequential and panoramic expression of what it means to be a believer and a follower of Christ. Since the instructions are recorded as having come directly from our Redeemer's mouth. Now, clearly, Matthew must have seen it in that light because he devoted so much time to it in his gospel. Now, I stated in an earlier lesson that considering the momentous nature of Yeshua's speech, it is curious that Matthew is the only gospel of the four that contains the Sermon on the Mount. Now, admittedly, Luke Luke chapter 6 contains something similar. And a predominant number of Bible scholars say that those verses in Luke are but another version of that same sermon. I, however, stand with another group of scholars and commentators who believe it is not. Okay. The sermon that begins at Luke 6.17, take a moment, I want you to start turning to that. Turn to Luke 6.17, and goes on to the end of that chapter, is regularly called the Sermon on the Plain, because it claims a different location than the Sermon on the Mount. And if you'll turn your Bibles, please, to Luke chapter 6, and we're only going to briefly glance at it, so you can see the differences. Move on down, please, and you get there, to uh, verse 17, and just take a look. You can kind of just very quickly see in the opening what's going on. Now, in the complete Jewish Bible, the introductory words to the Sermon on the Mount that we read in Matthew 5 are, seeing the crowds, Yeshua walked up the hill. What do we read in Luke 6, 17 to start things? Then he came down with them, meaning his 12 disciples, and stood on a level place. And the more familiar King James Version says, and he came down with them and stood in the plain. But what follows in Luke is something that is close to the words of the Beatitudes, but they're different and they're fewer. Afterwards are a few sayings. Again, just be looking at, looking it over. Afterwards are a few sayings and then something that Luke calls a parable. After that, there's a few more, a few other sayings, some of which bear resemblance to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew. Now, the Bible commentators who are convinced that the sermons in Luke 6 and Matthew 5 are actually one and the same, they base their conclusion on the foundational belief that Luke's gospel is the more accurate in his account of the event than Matthew. Because, for them, Matthew had an ulterior motive for not only including it in his gospel, but also for expanding upon it well beyond Luke's, even adding to the content, if not modifying the meaning of some of Yeshua's sermon to suit his own mindset. Now, my conclusion is that on its face, the purpose of the sermon in Luke 6, the description of the makeup of the people who are there, the geography where the speech was given, and the timing of it make it another and different speech, even though it had at its core the same underlying message as the sermon that Christ gave up on the hill the one called the Sermon on the Mount. However, it's not the same event. It's not the same speech. Now, I find it 
peculiar that many commentators seem to assume, I want you to think about this for a minute, that they seem to assume that nearly every speech or teaching of Christ must have been unique and one-off. That is, that each time he spoke and taught, he dealt with entirely different subject matter, such that he never repeated himself, nor said more or less the same things, but to different audiences in different locations. I mean, nothing's more common among teachers, speakers, leaders of all eras than to go around communicating a similar message, although perhaps structured a little differently each time, to a number of different audiences and crowds. I mean, even in our time of television, radio, and the internet, politicians, for instance, will use the same core message in a number of different settings, slightly modified each time to suit a particular audience. Clearly, there's never going to be a way to provide indisputable proof one way or the other on this debate as to whether both Matthew and Luke are reporting on the same speech or that they are each reporting on different speeches given at different places that are similar in message. Does it really matter then? Does it matter whether Luke's and Matthew's reports are both on Christ's seminal speech? Yes, it does. See, there is significance in the issue of the setting and the geography where Christ gave the Sermon on the Mount, something that would indeed have mattered more to Matthew, the learned, believing Jew, than to Luke, the learned, believing Gentile. It involves the reporting of Matthew, which appears in the fabric of the backdrop for his entire gospel account, that Yeshua of Nazareth was a kind of second Moses. Now, I'm not going to review what I explained to you about that in an earlier lesson. Only notice that in the case of the Sermon on the Mount, just as Moses went up to the top of a mountain, Sinai, to obtain God's Torah, and then came down to the side of a mountain, to instruct Israel in it, so in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus went up a mountain, a hill, to address Israel and then instruct them in the deeper understanding of the law and the Torah in general. Now, why do so many Christian scholars, commentators, Bible teachers, pastors, just not accept this connection between Moses and Christ? It is because they also do not accept that Christ in his Sermon on the Mount was instructing the people in the Torah. Rather, they see him as erasing and abolishing the Torah of Moses and then replacing it with his own new and different commandments, a Torah of Jesus. A replacement Torah that consisted of his own teachings and commands that overrode and replaced the ones his heavenly father gave to Moses 14 centuries earlier. Now, the significance of this theological worldview, which is, by the way, a mistaken and wholly unbiblical worldview, towers over the Christianity that was established beginning with Constantine in the 4th century A.D., and remains in practice today. All right, so let's open our Bibles to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is page 1227, 1227. We're going to read it all. Hmm. 
Seeing the crowds, Yeshua walked up the hill. After he sat down, his Talmudim, his disciples, came to him and he began to speak. And this is what he taught them. How blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. How blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. How blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. How blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. How blessed are those who show mercy, for they will be shown mercy. How blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. How blessed are those who make peace, for they will be called sons of God. How blessed are those who are persecuted, because they pursue righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. How blessed you are when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of vicious lies about you, because you follow me. Rejoice, be glad, because your reward in heaven is great. They persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. You are salt for the land. But if salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except being thrown out for people to trample on. You are a light for the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Likewise, when people light a lamp, they don't cover it over with a bowl but they put it on a lampstand so that it shines for everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they may see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. Now, don't think that I've come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to complete. Yes, indeed, I tell you. That until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a, a yud or a stroke is going to pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. So, whoever disobeys the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so is going to be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and so teaches will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness it's far greater than that of the Torah teachers and the Pharisees. You will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you have heard that our fathers were told, do not murder. And then anyone who commits murder will be subject to judgment. I tell you that anyone who nurses anger against his brother will be subject to judgment. That whoever calls his brother you good for nothing they will be brought up before the Sanhedrin. Whoever says, fool, incurs the penalty of burning in the fire of Gehenom. See, so if, if you're offering your gift at the temple altar, and then you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift where it is by the altar. Go, make peace with your brother. Then come back and offer your gift. Now, if someone sues you, come to terms with him quickly while you and he are on the way to the court, or he may hand you over to the judge, the judge to the officer of the court. You may be thrown in jail. Yes, indeed, I tell you, you will certainly not get out until you've paid the last penny. Now, you have heard that our fathers were told, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that a man who even looks at a woman with the purpose of lusting after her well, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you sin, gouge it out, throw it away. Better you should lose one part of you than have your whole body thrown into Gehenom. And if your right hand makes you sin, cut it off, throw it away. Better you should lose one part of you than have your whole body thrown into Gehenom. You know, what was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a get, a divorce document. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of fornication makes her 
an adulteress. And anyone who marries a divorcee commits adultery. Again, you have heard that our fathers were told, do not break your oath. Keep your vows to Adonai. I tell you, don't swear at all. Not by heaven, because that's God's throne. Not by earth, because that's his footstool. Not by Jerusalem, because it's the city of the great king. Don't swear by your head. You can't make a single hair white or black. Just let your yes be a simple yes. Your no, a simple no. Anything more than this has its origin in evil. You've heard that our fathers were told, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. I tell you, don't stand up against someone who does you wrong. On the contrary, if someone hits you on the right cheek, let them hit you on the left cheek too. If someone wants to sue you for your shirt, let them have your coat as well. If a soldier forces you to carry his pack a mile, carry it for two. When someone asks you for something, give it to him. When someone wants to borrow something, lend it to him. Now you've heard that our fathers were told, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Then you will become children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun shine on the good and on the bad people alike. He sends rain to the righteous and to the unrighteous alike. Now, what reward do you get if you love only those who love you? Why even the tax collectors do that? And if you are friendly, only to your friends. Are you doing anything out of the ordinary? Even the Gentiles do that. Therefore, be perfect. Just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, it's important that we establish the basis that underlies everything I'm going to be teaching you. A faith pillar of Torah class and Seed of Abraham Fellowship and all that we stand for. It is that Yeshua did not abolish the Torah and the prophets. And he also warned against the consequences of disobedience to the laws and the commandments contained within them in the slightest. You know, in a Christianity that nearly universally says the opposite in all of its institutions, strikes me as odd that some of the most revered and published Bible commentators would say things like the following, as with Daniel J. Harrington in his commentary on Matthew. He says this, The basic theme of the sermon is that Jesus came not to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. And from professors W.D. Davies and Dale C. Allison, in their enormous three-volume commentary on the book of Matthew, which is so highly regarded, by the way, among academics, that it is one of the chief reference sources for their own commentaries on Matthew's gospel. They say this, Matthew 5, verses 17 through 20, is primarily for catalepsis. That is, it's an anticipation of objections as the introduction or preamble to chapter 5, verses 21 through 48, it is intended to prevent the readers of this first gospel from making two errors. First, it plainly states that the subsequent paragraphs are not to be interpreted as they have been so often 
by many as antitheses. Antitheses that in at least two or three instances sets aside the Torah. Instead, Jesus upholds the law so that between him and Moses, there can be no real conflict. Then secondly, and despite the concord declared by Matthew 5, 17 through 19, verse 20 tells us that what Jesus requires of his followers surpasses what has tr traditionally been regarded by the scribes and the Pharisees as the requirements of the Torah. So although there is continuity with the past, the Messiah also brings something new, and it does not surprise when chapter 5, verses 21 through 28 goes beyond the letter of the law to demand even more. More. So in both quotes, these renowned mainstream Bible commentators are explicit in saying that whatever one might take from the Sermon on the Mount, it can never be that Christ was declaring that he came to abolish and or replace the law of Moses. Can't be. That said, Davies and Allison go further. And they say that in his interpretation of the Torah, Yeshua takes the requirements of obeying it to another and higher level. Let me put it this way, because I've said it to you before. Christ's requirements take God's laws and make them even more challenging, requiring even more discipline, more devotion, not less. You know, the common refrain of the church is, oh, the law given to Moses just is an outdated burden. It's just too heavy of a yoke. Just too heavy. Much too hard. Just not reasonable to follow it. Therefore, Christ came to abolish it all. And then with his new commandments, make life and a peaceful relationship with God much easier for his followers. A plain and honest reading of the Sermon on the Mount takes that false notion and just destroys it. I want to begin in verse 1 by again noting that Matthew says that Christ went up a hill in order to make a speech to throngs of Israelites, which consisted mostly of Jews. No doubt some remnants of other tribes of Israel than the Jews who represent Judah and Benjamin, and some who had engaged in intermarriage with Gentiles, uh, they were also present. This we can discern from the locations that were listed at the end of chapter 4 that tells us where these crowds came from. Now, to extract the best context for this epic sermon and who was there to hear it, we need to simply keep, in, uh, keep reading from the final couple of verses of chapter 4, right into the first verse of chapter 5. Because remember, when these scriptures were first created, they weren't divided into chapters and, and verses. That wasn't going to happen for another thousand years. So, you don't have to look at it, but just, I'm going to read this to you. This is how it follows when we start in Matthew 4.23, and we go through 5.23. Two without stopping. Listen to how it sounds and how it flows. Yeshua went all over the Galilee, the Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing people from every kind of disease and sickness. And word of him spread throughout all Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill, suffering from various diseases and pains, those who were held in the power of demons, epileptics, paralytics. He healed them. Huge crowds followed him from the Galilee, the ten towns, the Decapolis, 
Jerusalem, Judah, and Ever Yarden. That means cross the river. Seeing the crowds, Yeshua walked up the hill. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him and he began to speak. And this is what he taught them. You see how that flows? You just don't stop it at the chapter marking. You see the full context for this. Who was in the crowd? Now, we learned that the primary reason this enormous group of people came from many scores of miles away and more was for what? Healing. Healing of all kinds of maladies. They came because of Yeshua's growing reputation as a sodic, a holy man, a miracle worker who under the power of God could heal. Some holy men were also known for their wisdom, and they taught in addition to healing. So it wasn't out of character for Yeshua the Sadiq to draw huge crowds for the purpose of miracle healing, but also to speak profound truths to them. It's because as of this point in time, the Jews didn't yet suspect that Jesus was the Messiah. And Jesus had not yet publicly proclaimed that he was. So this goes back a couple weeks ago. So who did they think he was? He was a holy man, a miracle worker. Now, verse 3 begins what has for centuries been called the Beatitudes. And we get this strange English word, Beatitudes, from the Latin version of the Bible, where the word Beatus is used to translate the Greek word Makarios. Just as we learned that Matthew had a specific mathematical structure in mind, in the way he presented Yeshua's genealogy to begin his gospel, so now we find another obvious mathematical structure in the Beatitudes. It is that each of the eight Beatitudes contains 36 words in the Greek. Now, if this mathematical structure is intended to symbolize something, it remains a mystery to me what it might be. It is further complicated by the probability that the Greek version of Matthew was taken from the Hebrew. So, the word count in Hebrew could have been different than it is in the Greek. Some of the early church fathers, such, such as Augustine and Ambrose of Milan, believed that it was the number of the Beatitudes, eight, that was of interest, and that it was symbolic of the ascent of the soul into heaven. Now, that seems a stretch to me. And a few other early church fathers, besides those I named, accepted such a solution. I don't wish to speculate about it except to notice that this interesting structure of eight beatitudes of 36 Greek words each does exist. Perhaps they were constructed in this way for the purpose of easier memorization. Now, the first beatitude is verse 3, and it is, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Now, this beatitude has had a number of opinions written about its meaning because it's not at all clear. What exactly characterizes a person who's poor in spirit? Since it says that such a person is blessed, then obviously it means that a person who is poor in spirit is benefiting from it, at least in the spiritual sense, or that Christ approves of it. So to try and decipher this, let's first understand what blessed means. Assuming that Matthew originally wrote his gospel in Hebrew, then likely what we have is a Greek translation of the Hebrew word 
baraka. And the Greek word used to translate baraka is makarios, and it means to be favored or fortunate or happy. That is essentially the same meaning as bercha. So really, it's a good, solid translation. Bercha, makarios, blessed. Second is the issue of what it means to be poor in spirit. Now, I've heard a number of sermons over my lifetime on this exact matter, and I'm not sure any to agree on the meaning. Because it is supposed to be a positive and desirable trait, then what about being poor in spirit, spirit makes a person happy or fortunate? Dr. David Flusser believes that especially the first three Beatitudes are more of a description of just who constitutes this enormous audience that follows Jesus up the hill in the Galilee. Now, Dr. Flusser, now deceased, is a legend among Hebrew scholars. And he is to be listened to. He doesn't make brash statements. Rather, he puts forward well-researched conclusions and opinions. Here is his conclusion about the meaning and intent of the term poor in spirit, as explained in his widely read book entitled Jesus. Dr. Flusser says this, now, for the first time, because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we can understand the phrase, the poor in spirit. It was a title of honor among the Essens. These are the poor to whom the Holy Spirit is given. In another but separate quote, Flusser explains that among the essence, and this is all taken from the Dead Sea Scrolls, this term, the poor in spirit, referred to a person who was living in a spirit of poverty, humility, purity, and simplicity. Just as today, a good orator will acknowledge those who make up his audience. It was the same way in Yeshua's day. And assuming that what Flusser says concerning the clarification about this strange phrase that the Dead Sea Scrolls provide for us is correct, I have no reason to doubt it, we can rather confidently predict that it was the Essens, perhaps those who lived on the fringe of the Essens movement, that Yeshua was acknowledging. And since we're told that many of his audience came from Judah, in the south, where the Essens had their desert enclave next to the Dead Sea, and from Syria up in the north, where it is known by historical record that a substantial Essen community lived in the city of Damascus, then it makes sense that many members of the pious and scripturally knowledgeable Essen community might attend. Yeshua's sermon. But now, what is the intent of including the statement that for certain members of the Essens, the kingdom of heaven is theirs? Now, we have spoken in earlier lessons that one of the that, that the kingdom of heaven is not a place. Not a place. It's a spiritual condition. When one repents of sinning and trusts in Messiah Yeshua, they receive the Holy Spirit. And as a result, the kingdom of heaven now lives within them. Now notice the grammar. It is not some time in the future that the kingdom of heaven will be theirs, but rather it is that when they receive the Holy Spirit, the kingdom becomes theirs. Now, the next beatitude is number four. 
or rather it's in verse four. And it says, blessed are those who mourn for they shall become comforted. Now, because the premise is that those who mourn will experience some kind of religious joy, be blessed. Then one has to ask, what's this mourning has to do with? What's it about? Does it mean those who mourn the dead? Such as a dear departed family member. And since Yeshua is referring in a rather general way to certain of his large audience, could death really be the subject of the mourners? I think not. I see this as a reference to the prophet Isaiah in chapter 61 of his book. Starting with verse 1, we read this. The spirit of Adonai Elohim is upon me because Adonai has anointed me to announce good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom to the captives, to let out into light those bound in the dark, to proclaim the year of the favor of Adonai and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, yes, provide for those in Zion who mourn, giving them garlands instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, a cloak of praise instead of a heavy spirit so that they will be called oaks of righteousness planted by Adonai, in which he takes pride. They will rebuild the ancient ruins, restore the sites long ago, long ago destroyed. They will renew the ruined cities that destroyed many generations ago. Now, this is a messianic prophecy in Isaiah. So the general condition of the mourning that Yeshua is speaking about doesn't so much, so much concern grieving over the dead. Rather, it is mourning over the destroyed cities of Israel that is a result of Israel's unfaithfulness, Israel's sinning. Now, it is also mourning over the oppression of the children of Israel, the oppression they're suffering at the hands of foreign conquerors, which, by the way, is God's judgment against them. For their unfaithfulness. But also in Isaiah 61, something changes. And now the Lord will call his formerly unfaithful, but now repentant people, oaks of righteousness. Love that expression, oaks of righteousness. As opposed to captives and brokenhearted. The mourners will become comforted. Because they will see that Israel is in the process of being delivered and restored. Thus, the mention of the mourners is they will be or shall be comforted. That is, it's to occur later in the future when this comforting is going to come to its fullest fruition. This is in contrast to the first beatitude in which the blessing will be bestowed, bestowed more or less immediately in the present. So those among the crowd that Yeshua is addressing in this second beatitude are called mourners. This is because they're sorry that their sin and the sins of their ancestors has led their land to being under the control of heathens. And they're suffering under the hand of Roman subjugation. Now the third beatitude maybe ahead of you here a little bit, I apologize. The third beatitude is in verse 5. And it is, how blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Now you might immediately notice <laughs> I have substituted the word land for earth which we find in most Bible versions, the meek will inherit the earth. Now, before we delve into that issue, let's define who or what the meek are. The backdrop of this beatitude is Psalm 37. So let's read together a substantial portion of it. Turn to Psalm 37, which, if you have a complete Jewish Bible, Begins on page 824, 824. 
Psalm 37. Turn there now, please. I'm going to read the first 13 verses. By David, do not be upset by evildoers or envious of those who do wrong. For soon they will wither like grass, fade like the green in the fields. Trust in Adonai and do good. Settle in the land and feed on faithfulness. Then you will delight yourself in Adonai and he will give you your heart's desire. Commit your way to Adonai. Trust in him and he will act. He will make your vindication shine forth like light, the justice of your cause like the noonday sun. Be still before Adonai. Wait patiently till he comes. Don't be upset by those whose way succeeds because of their wicked plans. Stop being angry. Put aside rage. Don't be upset. It leads to evil. For evildoers will be cut off, but those hoping at an eye will inherit the land. Soon the wicked will be no more. You will look for his place. He won't be there. But the meek will inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and grinds his teeth at him, but Adonai laughs at the wicked, knowing his day will come. Now, this is a messianic psalm of David that speaks of a future time when the meek will inherit the land, the land referring to Israel. Meek is another word in the Bible whose definition is not necessarily always agreed upon. And it seems to be used differently in different settings. Often it carries the obvious meaning of gentleness and mildness. But here in Psalm 37, 11, the word is probably better understood as the powerless, the powerless, because the righteous are being oppressed by the wicked. Since it seems very likely that Yeshua was making reference to Psalm 37 in this beatitude, then his use of the term the meek probably means the same, it means the powerless. Further in Psalm 37, the Hebrew word for what it is that the meek shall inherit is Eretz. Eretz in Hebrew. Eretz can mean land or it can mean earth. However, we must not think of earth as meaning the formal name of our planet, planet earth. Rather, biblically, Earth is another way of saying the undefined expanse of dry land that lies under the sky. That's what it means. David's audience for his psalm was Israelites. Jesus' audience for his sermon was Israelites. Therefore, the meek in both cases are Israelites. That's who he's talking to or at least a portion of the Israelites. Biblically, the inheritance of the Israelites is what? It's the land of Israel, formerly the land of Canaan. Therefore, the meaning of the meek shall inherit the land is that the powerless Israelites shall, at some point, permanently inherit the land of Israel, such they will no longer be occupied and oppressed by a foreign power, which represents wickedness. Now, I want to pause here to put something forth. I think mostly is a suggestion, maybe a theory, but I can't in good conscience say it's a fact. When I look at these Beatitudes thus far, and when I think about the Jewish Yeshua speaking to a Jewish crowd, and the Jewish Matthew using the Jewish manner in which he structured his gospel, written to be read by Jewish believers. 
I see a real possibility that each of these Beatitudes is meant to be interpreted in both the Peshat and the Remez senses. That is, in the simple plain sense, the Peshat, as well as in a somewhat literal sense that also incorporates a, 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 an important hint, which is called Remez. So in the first Beatitude, when Yeshua speaks of the poor in spirit, the reference in the Peshat interpretation sense is to the people in the crowd who hold this honorary title among the sect of the essence, people who were standing and sitting directly before him during a sermon. Yet when we look a little bit deeper from the Remez interpretation sense, we understand that the way one becomes poor in spirit among the essence was by their definition receiving the Holy Spirit. Therefore, in a larger sense, all who truly receive the Holy Spirit through repentance and trust in Christ, Israelites and Gentiles, believers, can be considered as included among the poor in spirit, and thus be made happy and joyful, blessed now and eternally. In the second beatitude, we're told those who mourn will be comforted. From the shot sense, the mourners are mourning over the ruination of the Holy Land of Israel and the subsequent oppressions of Assyria, Babylon, and Greece in the past, and now presently Rome. So the comforting is that even in this, they can have personal peace because there is hope that God will remove these pagan occupiers. But from the Remez sense, the mourners are those worshipers of God who are mourning over the ruination of the entire earth. Because due to mankind's unfaithfulness, Wickedness rules universally. The mourners are the righteous, all who have repented and put their trust in Messiah, Jews and Gentiles. And all of these, us, can look forward to being comforted when the Lord comes in power and glory to destroy evil, to rule in justice and mercy over all the earth, and to restore it. In the third beatitude, the meek will inherit the earth. In the Peshat sense, those Israelites in the audience who are powerless before the occupation of Rome are being told that nonetheless, they will receive the inheritance of God that God promised to them, the land of Canaan, before their ancestors left Egypt. In the Remez sense, the powerless followers of Messiah, Jew and Gentile, will together receive the even larger inheritance promised by God to be co-rulers along with Christ over all the earth's inhabitants. This co-rulership is the fullest fulfillment of the promise of the first beatitude that the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, the fourth beatitude is verse 6. How blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, the idea of hunger and thirsting after righteousness is not about food and drink. Rather, it is a spiritual longing. But this longing is not one of passivity. It speaks of an active search, working to find it. The question to be answered about this beatitude is, whose righteousness is being sought? What kind of righteousness is being thirsted for? Is it human righteousness? That is, is it something that is accomplished by means of our 
good works and deeds? The answer is that it is God's righteousness that Yeshua is referring to. He is borrowing from a Psalm of David, Psalm 107. Now we won't go over it all, so here's the pertinent part. Psalm 107, verses 2 through 9. Let those redeemed by Adonai say it. Those he redeemed from the power of the foe. He gathered them from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the sea. They wandered in the desert on paths through the wastes without finding an inhabited city. They were hunger, they were hungry and thirsty. Their life was ebbing away. In their trouble, they cried to Adonai, and he rescued them from their distress. He led them by a direct path to a city where they could live. Let them give thanks to Adonai for his grace, for his wonders bestowed on humanity, for he has satisfied the hungry and filled the starving with good. Notice that it is God's redeemed that is being addressed. God's redeemed. From the Peshat interpretation sense, the redeemed represent all Israelites. Because 1400 years earlier, all the tribes of Israel were redeemed from Egypt. The wandering in the desert recalls the wilderness journey of the Exodus. God rescued them. And when they were finally properly prepared, he took them to a city where they could live meaning Jerusalem. God also satisfied the hungry Israelites by giving them manna to eat, divinely provided sustenance. He did it the entire time they were wandering without a home of their own. He provided them with water as needed, often in undeniably miraculous ways. But in the Remez interpretation sense, the redeemed are all people. Jew and Gentile, who have been redeemed from their sins by placing their trust in the God of Israel and his son, Yeshua. Before we did that, we were wandering aimlessly in a desert of sin and purposelessness. We were hungry. We were thirsty for deliverance from our emptiness, from our eternal death. But since the molten core of God's righteousness is his will to deliver and save, even though at the time we weren't aware of it. By his grace, he has bestowed his righteousness upon us and thus has satiated the thirst, satisfied the hunger of our souls, and given us eternal life with him. Now, the metaphor of hunger and thirst is representing a deep down seeking of God. Even when we don't know, that's what we sought. It's found in several places in God's Word, among, I think, the most moving and the most instructive. It has to be Isaiah chapter 32. There, the matter of God's righteousness, as opposed to human righteousness, becomes a little bit more clear. So let's read it together to close out today's lesson. Turn to Isaiah chapter 32. Isaiah chapter 32. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, you're going to find it on page 485. I want you to follow along with me. It's quite amazing. Isaiah chapter 32, page 485, if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Isaiah 32. There is coming a king who will rule justly, and princes who will rule uprightly. A man will be like a refuge from the wind like protection from a storm, like streams of water on arid ground, like a rock cliff shading a weary land. The eyes of those seeing will not be closed. The ears of those hearing will pay close attention. 
The minds of the impetuous will learn to weigh carefully. The tongues of the stutterers will speak steadily and clearly. The mean person will no longer be called generous, or the miserly said to be noble. For the mean person will speak meanness, his heart planning evil, so that he can act godlessly, spreading error concerning Adonai, as he lets the hungry go on starving and deprives the thirsty of drink. The mean person's means are mean. He devises wicked devices to ruin the poor and needy with lies, even when their cause is just. But the generous person devises generous things, and his generosity will keep him standing. You women who are so complacent, listen to me. Overconfident women, pay attention to my words. In a year and a few days more, you overconfident women will shudder because the vintage will fail and the harvest will not come. Tremble, you complacent women. Shudder, you overconfident women. Strip bare, wear sackcloth to cover yourselves. Beat your breasts in mourning for the pleasant fields and the fruitful vines for the land of my people producing thorns and briars for all the happy homes and the joyful city, for the palace will be abandoned and the crowded city deserted. Ophel and fortress, wastelands forever, a delight for wild donkeys, a pasture for flocks, till the spirit is poured out on us from above and the desert becomes a fertile field. With the fertile field regarded as a forest, then justice will dwell in the desert and righteousness abide in the fertile field. The effect of righteousness will be peace. The result of righteousness, quiet trust forever. My people will live in a peaceful place, in secure neighborhoods, in tranquil dwellings. Just as the forest will surely come down, the city will surely be laid low. Happy are you who sow by all streams, letting oxen and donkeys roam freely. We're going to begin with the fifth beatitude next week.